If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more apps out there. You can make money for your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast, all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. This podcast contains adult content with depictions of violence and gore. Listener discretion is advised. This podcast contains adult content with depictions of violence and gore. Listener discretion is advised. Out of the darkness and into the fire. see you there um oh this don't worry there are no teeth so completely harmless but metal work can be dangerous come on help me out of this thing it's starting to pinch in not so fun places and while you help me get out i'll tell you about two crazy lovers that were all about metal their tale is called harlots of hardware a tale of rust and lust. You can meet a lot of interesting people when you're a grinder girl. What's a grinder girl, you ask? Ever been to a nightclub or if you are on the darker side of a bondage club and seen girls dressed in head to toe metal? They are typically front and center, or on a raised stage, like metalwork goddesses on their deuses, gyrating to the music pumping through the venue as they press power tools to their most sensual body zones. Sparks undulate around their sweat-covered bodies, faces molded into elated ecstasy as they hug the line of death and danger. Those are grinder girls. And I love every minute of being one. The crowd gets turned on by the show and I get paid. And like I said, you meet the most interesting people. For instance, I met my wife, Candace, on a performance night. I was still a fledgling grinder in the New York club scene. Cass, on the other hand, was the biggest performer in the tri-state area. I watched like a giddy cloaked stalker as she moved across the stage, gliding a belt sander across her pelvis. Her eyes were wild, a Valkyrian cry parting her silver lips. To say I was infatuated is putting it mildly. I felt like a court gesture, sharing this queen's space Imagine my surprise when she found me after our first show together. Hey, Angela, right? I'm Cassidy. She said, hand already extended in my direction. (gasps) Hi, I quietly whispered. Oh, don't worry. I don't bite. But I won't mind if you did. Cass winked and my breath snapped away with that motion. From that moment, an easy friendship was born. 
on the lid of that seductive eye. Cass took me under her wing for the next year. She taught me new choreography, showed me where to procure toys and gear which were easy on my wallet, all while blustering up my confidence on stage. It was no surprise to the ladies within our professional circle when we announced our duo act. We started billing ourselves as Steel Angels, and in no time, we were booking shows across the U.S., we traveled from city to city, dungeon to dungeon, like two metal gypsies in the wind. I never dreamed I would be this successful, nor to have a partner like Cassidy. As we rolled into another town six months into our partnership, I couldn't contain the growing flame in my heart for Cassidy. It was like I was a prepubescent child on the playground, just realizing I had feelings for Jane's and not John's. Gathering strength from the steel wrapped around my frame, I approached Cass one night, exposing the truth of my adoration towards her. In the murky yellow light of the BDSM dungeon, Cassidy stood before me, frozen to the floor from my declaration. As the clock ticked by, I swore that I had just ruined a good thing until she pulled me in for a soul-crushing kiss. Although our status changed from friends to lovers, not much else changed about our relationship after that devastating kiss. A weight, as cliche as it sounds, was lifted from us. I dedicated myself to showing Cassidy just how much she meant to me in every way a person could imagine. So, I wanted to talk to you about something. We were sitting in our van, an old Mercedes camper we turned into a somewhat reliable tour slash home van when Cass caught me mid-dunk of a fry into my vanilla frosty. I paused for a minute before swirling the fry around the rim. I didn't take my eyes off the trench I was making in the frosted cream, my stomach sinking into the groove I dug. You know, nothing ever good comes after. We need to talk, I muttered, with a little bite in my tone. Cass wrapped her delicate fingers around my wrist, the fry completely soggy now. True, but this isn't one of those times. At least I hope not. <laughs> well, that's reassuring. Cassidy's <laughs> soft laugh filled the small space, and my stomach eased slightly. I, I know this. Cassidy gestured to the van flippantly, before resting her other hand on top of mine. It's just a job for you. My brows pulled together, not following her train of thought, and before I could ask what she meant, she continued. But for me, it's more than that. Metal is... How can I put this? Everything to me. I know that. I didn't. At least, not in the way I thought I had. I always knew this career, this lifestyle, meant something entirely different to Cass than myself. I just chalked it up to an extreme hobby. Cassidy narrowed her eyes at me, clearly not buying what I was selling. I don't think you do. Let me put it this way. You love fries and vanilla shakes, even though they don't go together. But you are obsessed with their flavor combination. I nodded, trying to follow along. Well, I love metal like you love fries and vanilla shakes. If I could entomb myself with metal at all times, I would be. It just gives me something that I've never experienced anywhere. I stared back at my girlfriend, her eyes glimmering with a silent plea. The corners darkened with self-conscious fear. I pulled her to my chest, my hands rubbing her back and soothing her hair. Whatever makes you happy, Angel. If you want to run around in metal wares for the rest of eternity, I'll run right next to you. Okay? Promise? For eternity? 
<laughs> for eternity. First comes love. Isn't that what the rhyme says? And soon came marriage. By the time we were engaged and set to marry, Cassidy had fully embraced her love for all things metal. Her arms were now covered in biomechanical style ink, elevating her to the status of Terminator Girl at many of our shows. Her angelic face sported a plethora of new piercings, a few I had gifted her via the teachings of a master piercer. In all honesty, the extra metal and piercing acts didn't derail me from loving her. In fact, it only made me more enamored with my metalwork angel. But Cass's infatuation transcended to psychosis. Her collection of metalwork clothing grew to restricting harnesses, steel chastity belts, painfully braided garters, and chokers that gave new meaning to the word suffocated, all of which she wore as she glided down the aisle toward me. She was irrevocably transformed into my alloy seraph. Hey, do you remember that dentist we met at Paddles NYC about a month or two back? I think his name was Dr. Pine? We walked hand in hand through Bryant Park, the electricity of the city warming my heart after another long stint on the tour circuit. Birds chortled against the choir of disgruntled motorists, and the park was a buzz with Saturday lurkers, performers, and millennials all out to enjoy the NYC spring day. My fingers absently caressed the ring of dermal diamonds on Cassidy's ring finger, as I replied, Uh, I think so. Why do you ask? Cassidy bounced excitedly from dock to dock, pale face glowing. Well, I got in contact with him. He said he would hook me up with a good deal on metal canine replacements. Her pearly white sparkled in the spring sunlight, and I withheld a wince. I loved her smile, but I didn't want to come across as unsupportive. At the end of the day, it was her body. <laughs> That's great, Angel. Uh, but exactly how much will that cost? Oh, don't worry about it. Like I said, Dr. Pine is giving me the full hookup. She winked, pulling me closer to her for a chaste kiss. I felt the press of her kiss, but my toes remained stubby planks in my boots, as opposed to their curled rigor when Cass kissed me. This scenario was becoming more frequent. Rising concern battled in my brain with the iron need to be a benevolent partner. However, her obsession was ringing every alarm in a five-mile radius. I paced an invisible trench into the hardwood floor of the living room, taking repeated glances at the clock over the mantel. 11.53. As it had been ten seconds ago. Four days. Four fucking days Cassidy had been gone. Just a text saying, Good morning. Love you. Days ago. Then, silence. If she wasn't dead in a ditch somewhere, I was going to kill her. I called everyone we knew, every, quote, hookup connection she had in the past, coming up with fuck all. The front door clicked open and I snapped to a halt. The clock whispered, 12.01. Five days now. I headed her off at the tail of the hallway entrance, feet firmly planted, ready for a full battle. Hey, baby. Casty beamed, ignoring my deafening glare. What do you think? Casty pulled back the hood of her jacket to unveil subdermal platinum horn implants. Mother fucking horns. My body quaked so hard I was sure I would start the first New York earthquake. 
What do I think? What do I think? What the fuck do you think I think, Cass? You've been gone for five days, waltz in here like nothing happened, and want me to fawn over your latest addition? Cass's face bloomed red spots filled with chargon. I'm sorry, baby. I I wanted to surprise you, that's all. Plus, after the procedure, I was really out of it, and Tom kept me for monitoring through the healing process, and- Tom? Who the fuck is Tom? My voice ping-ponged off the living room walls, shrinking Cass with each volleyed syllable. I sighed, the weight of everything, hitting me at neck break speed, making me dizzy. (sighs) I'm sorry too, Cass. The words perking up my angel with relief for a moment. But I can't, I can't do this anymore. The fall of her face almost sent me backpedaling. However, it was too late to turn back now. We were already free falling. I can't have you disappearing for days at a time just to show up with surprise modifications. My trust in you is not existent because all you tell me is that someone's friend or someone you just met who you won't let me meet and you barely even know is going to hook you up with some new modification deal and hide every little detail of that deal from me. How are you even meeting these people, Cass? Huh? I, I love you, baby. I really do, but do you realize how dangerous this is? I was pleading with her now, my earlier declaration fracturing the foundation of our relationship. Angela, I promise you, there is nothing to worry about. And frankly, I'm only a couple more procedures away from being completely set. I'll have my perfect body and just you see, baby. It's going to be glorious. Cass smiled, her eyes drifting inward as she beheld the image of her superb new body. For the first time in our relationship, I recoiled from my lover. I... I can't do this anymore, Cassidy. I can't just sit around waiting for you to come home from getting God knows what done by God knows who. No more procedures. No more mods. It's it's either me or your fucking metal, Cassidy. You have to choose. Me or the metal. My words bombed the room, each one hitting their target leaving devastation of apocalyptic proportion in its wake. Cass stood in the wreckage, chest heaving with effort as the silence divided us, as the space between us grew. I knew, I knew my angel was too far out of my reach. I was never a strong-willed individual especially when it involved Cassidy. I found myself ascending the stairs to our home nearly five days after our fight. My knees bucked wildly beneath my jeans, threatening to cast me dumbly onto the filthy concrete steps. There was too much between us for me to walk out without a word. I owed it to us to at least sit down and talk with her because deep down, the thought of Losing her felt like dying. She was the love of my life. However, I couldn't deny that her secretive obsession troubled me down to my core. I pushed the front door open, finding our home in total darkness. My teeth already grinding with nervous electricity. I prowled slowly inside flicking on switches as I moved into the depths. My boot hit something as I flicked on the living room light. I looked down and immediately backed out the way I came. Cassidy's power tools lay at my feet, with a few more haphazardly strewn throughout the space. Viscous black puddles dotted across the floor and rugs, the sight shifting me into panic. Cass? Cassidy? Are you here? My voice volleyed around the home as I searched frantically for her. 
As I rounded the door of our bedroom, I saw the prone figure of Cass lying on the bed. I ran to her, knees finally failing as I hit the foot of the bed. They squished into a pool of something I didn't want to look down and verify its identity. My body shivered as the cold liquid soaked through my jeans and I brushed hair out of Cass's face. Cass, baby, please, please tell me you're okay. My voice shook as I waited for her to respond or worse, not at all. Slowly, her eyes fluttered open. Angela? Is that you? Cass hoisted herself slowly from the bed. She rose from the bed, and in the darkness, I could barely make out that there was something wrong with her silhouette. She turned to flick on the bedside lamp, and my hands rose to my mouth in horror. Before me, Cass stood shrouded in blood and metal. Her once exquisite alabaster skin is a ghoulish, murky gray. From clear blood loss, scrapes of tingy metal ran from her feet to her hips, rivulets screwed tightly into the bone. They danced crookedly from her skin as blood swirled from each. A chastity belt snaked its way around the dips of her hips, bolted in with thick chains already rusting from mixing with her blood. Each fingertip was dipped with a flat screw leading into her palm, which were a mess of coppery wires that ran up her forearm. Her favorite chest harness fastened hastily into her ribcage with six large bolts. Cass took a step toward me, arms outstretched to pull me into her alloy embrace. See, baby? All I needed was a few more procedures. It's over now. <gasps> I'm finally perfect. Blood oozed from Casty's mouth as her lips unhinged to show rows of gnarled platinum teeth. Bile snaked up my esophagus, tickling the base of my tongue. I wanted to run, but my feet remained bolted to the floor. Corpse fingers wrapped around my wrist, jolting me to the horror of my angel's obsession. What's wrong, Angela? I, I know this is a bit more than we ever talked about, but you did promise me you were okay with this. Remember? As long as it makes me happy. You're happy, right, baby? The scent of iron nipped at my nose as Cass moved in for a kiss. This was a far cry from a bit more than what we talked about. I twisted from her grasp, my skin crawling from her frigid touch. Cassidy, we need to get you to the hospital. No. Why can't you see? This is who I was meant to be. This is who we were meant to be. Before I could soak in her words, she lunged for me, her extra weight flattening me to the bedroom floor with ease. My head slammed against the hardwood and the world before me winked out. When the world reignited before my eyes once more, I was greeted with blistering pain through the top of my foot. My head rolled to the sound and I shot up immediately. Cass straddled my legs, her back to me, nail gun in hand. She pivoted at the waist, her platinum mouth grinning like a sedated alley cat. <laughs> oh God, you're awake. I figured I'd help begin your transformation, seeing as my own is now complete. She rose to reveal my mutilated right foot. Silver nails protruded from the pad of my foot, and I glanced up to see a metal sheet in Cassidy's hand. Doesn't the adrenaline just feel amazing? <laughs> just the sight of you. Cass knelt, her metal body creaking as she climbed up my body nail gun still in hand. <gasps> what the fuck, Cass? I screamed, tears falling rapidly down my face. My head swiveled from side to side, taking in the discarded pieces scattered around me. A round pearlescent plate gleamed in the low light, and I lunged for it, dislodging Cass in the surprised movement. She crashed to the floor, a sharp cry leaving her lips. I whipped around, plate in hand, striking her in the temple. Metal gonged in the small space, reverberating my ears and limbs. 
cast slumped to the floor from the impact or blood loss, I wasn't sure, before collapsing beside her, my world dimming for the second time in one night. When I finally came to, I was lying in a hospital bed, a nurse checking my vitals. She scurried off to get a doctor the moment she noticed my eyes open. Luckily, a neighbor had heard the commotion from our home and called the police. We were able to quickly call us an ambulance and rush us to the hospital. My foot was severely damaged. However, the doctor reassured me it was fixable with surgery. Many surgeries. Cass, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. There was far more damage than what I could see in the dim light of our bedroom. The doctors removed a metal rod from her thigh she had managed to shove in through a small incision. Sixteen screws were removed from her hips and lower spine. Numerous petite pins descended from her upper arm and neck. The wiring I noticed in her palms were also deeply embedded into her flesh. Her mouth was the most horrific of all. Realizing she was unable to replace most of her back molars, she drove nail after nail through each, shattering them in the process. Infection raging through her body to the point of falling septic. When all was said and done, the doctors were forced to remove all four of her limbs, replacing them with prosthetics, multiple plates and rods now littered her back properly, and her jaw had to be completely wired shut. We did go to trial, much to my chagrin, but Cass was quickly deemed unfit to sit for trial and sentenced to a mental institution in upstate New York. I only heard from her once. A letter came for me in the mail as I was packing up the last boxes of our home. I sat on our stoop for one final time as I read her final words to me. Dear Angela, I'm so sorry for everything that happened. I don't know what came over me, to be honest, and I completely understand if you don't want to see me again. These last eight months, I have been diligently working on improving myself every single day. The doctors say they're really impressed with my progress with my prosthetics. I don't want to admit it out loud, but I love the titanium prosthetics I was given. I'm basically an upgraded version of myself. At this point, I'm more metal than ever before. I wonder if they'll let me replace anything else. It's too soon to ask. Got to show them I can handle what they gave me, right? I realize forcing you to change was wrong because all you ever did was support me. I shouldn't have pushed my images of perfection on you. I hope one day we will be reunited again. I love you always. Steel angels forever. This has been a Morbid Forest production. On this week's episode, you've heard Harlots of Hardware, A Tale of Rust and Lust, written by Sean Moreau and narrated by Naomi Richards and Jordan Hollingsworth. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of The Morbid Forest. And while you're at it, don't forget to rate and review us on both Spotify and on Apple Podcast, both of which are the best way to get us to more travelers just like you. Interested in narrating or hearing a story on the show? Reach out to us at themorbidforest at gmail.com. And as always, thanks so much for supporting us. You don't know how much it means to have you guys listening to us every week. And with that, we'll see you next week, travelers on... The Morbid Forest.